All right, well, welcome back, everyone. I know it's probably sooner than a lot of you expected after my, my last video, uh, but I've been down in Texas for the summer. I, w I was interning with SpaceX down there, but uh, I finished that up just three months, and I'm on the way back home right now, and in another three or four weeks, I'm gonna be moving to California uh, to go become an engineer building electric airplanes and that sort of thing, which is exciting. But I have a few weeks in between those two things at home, so I'll be able to get some work done on the Speedster. And I just passed through Tennessee where I picked up a second Jaguar 2.4 liter straight six, the same as the first one I got a long time ago. Uh, and this one supposedly ran a number of months ago whenever the guy pulled it from uh, the original car it was in. and. So the plan is to get this engine home. Um, my dad's gonna be helping me out. We're gonna tear it down, see if we can get it running. If we can get it running, we're gonna see if we can get it in the Speedster and see if we can get it to the point where I can actually maybe take it for a drive around the yard a couple times. So it's not gonna be easy. I think we have like 25 days or so, and this is not one of those reality TV car shows where success is inevitable, but um, we're gonna see if we can do it. So like I said, 25 days to get a running engine and potentially a driving car, so <laughs> game on. So for a long time, people have been asking about what the deal was with the first engine that I picked up um, over two years ago by now. And basically that one, you know, I tore it down and was planning to get it rebuilt, had it sitting at the machine shop for a while, um, but we just kept uncovering more problems with it and it just wasn't really going anywhere. So I found this one, which is basically the same engine, and picked it up, like I said, picked it up on my way home, and this one was sort of the typical ran when parked type of deal. The guy who had it said he got it to fire up briefly after he took it out of the original Jag, um, but then had it sitting outside for, um, an unknown number of months and it definitely got some water in it. So we're going to tear it down here and see how much is salvageable. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> We got the oil pan off and we're able to take a, a better look at the bottom end of the engine here. And it wasn't that bad upon first glance. All, any of the standing water was just at the bottom of the oil pan, so that didn't really corrode things too badly. But just from sitting in the humidity, some of the cylinder walls that were exposed on the, the underside there had developed a pretty bad layer of very crumbly, sandpapery type rust on it. Let's try to rock it. A little bit of water. <laughs> and so once we got the head off and inspected the tops of the pistons here, we saw that this engine had actually been bored out uh, in, at some time in the past. The cylinders were bored 30 thou over standard size. And that's the maximum rebore size for this engine. So whatever we have in terms of cylinder walls is sort of what we're gonna get and we can only hope to clean them up as much as possible. The crankshaft came out here without too much of a fuss and it seemed to be in pretty good condition which was a good sign and you can see the rods here where some of them were kind of stuck to the wrist pins they didn't um, rotate very freely there but one of the pistons was actually able to slide out of the bore um, just by itself like this and that crusty layer of rust that I mentioned earlier on some of the cylinders was also on every one of the connecting rods that you can kind of see here. It was a very crumbly, crusty layer of rust there, uh, which will have to be cleaned off as thoroughly as we can. And that rust in the cylinder, we were able to clean out by taking a razor blade and just sort of scraping the cylinder walls and just scraping as much of that rust off as we could. And then once we did that, uh, we were able to get all this, the pistons out unscathed. And then here I'm just using a honing tool that we bought just to kind of clean it up as much as we can. Again, this is already bored over to the maximum size, so we can't actually take these and bore it out any more. Uh, but we're doing the best we can with what we've got here. 
All right, so we got the engine all taken apart here, cleaned out as best as we could, honed out the cylinders a little bit just to clean them up. You can see, these three aren't bad. These three were uh, much worse. This is the worst one, though. This had corrosion near the top, whereas these two had most of their corrosion near the bottom, not in the combustion area, which isn't as big of a deal, but, you know, we honed them out, and for, for our purposes, we're gonna call that good enough. Uh, we got the rest of it here taken apart, all laid out and organized as, as much as you reasonably can, and that all taken apart. Crankshaft actually looks pretty good. No, like, big grooves where, I mean, a couple places you can feel it a little bit, but not terrible. Bearings are in, you know, various states of conditions, but we've made the decision here. We're just gonna clean everything up as much as we can, clean all the rust off, you know, uh, maybe polish the crank a little bit just to, you know, get any of the grit and stuff off there, and then uh, throw it back together in here. Again, this is not how you rebuild an engine. Success in this case is not 30,000 miles of maintenance-free driving. Success is get it running and drive around the yard for like 10 minutes. So do not take any of this video as an, an like educational source of rebuilding engines. Neither of us are engine builders. So to clean up the rust off of the connecting rods here, you can see we just sort of lightly sandblasted them a little bit here. We have an old wrist pin and an old um, set of bearings in there to protect those surfaces so those pieces are not going into the final assembly. Uh, but this ended up working out pretty well. It's not ideal and you have to clean it up really well after the fact though because of course you don't want to get any sand in the actual engine because that wouldn't be good. Okay, so you saw us there sort of cleaning up the um, piston and, and rod components here and they actually clean up pretty darn nicely. You can see, you know, it moves nice and smoothly. These pistons, you know, these are newer pistons that are 30 thou over um, that were part of a rebuild at some point. So you can see they haven't been run that much. They cleaned up very nicely. Even all the rings too. Rings look great. A few of the pistons had some stuck rings that were hard to get out, but um, that wasn't too much of an issue in the end. Even the rods themselves cleaned up really nicely with a little bit of sandblasting there and some thorough cleaning afterwards. You saw how rusty they were beforehand, but yeah, so that's one of the full piston assemblies here. Got all the main caps also cleaned up here with the, their respective bearings sitting in there for now. Uh, I got the crankshaft over here. I took this to a local machine shop to have the journals just polished up a little bit, not ground at all, just cleaned up. You can see there's still some pitting like in the corners of some of the journals here where there was um, some rust. But that's not too much of a concern because the bearings don't actually ride that far out on the sides of the journals. So the rest of it cleaned up really nicely. So I think that that ought to work for, for our purposes. So now we're moving back on to assembly here, starting with the crankshaft here after we got all the bearings set into their, the journals there. And I'm using some white lithium grease here as an assembly lube on all these parts, just because that was what was recommended to me by the guy at the engine shop that I took this to. Uh, so I'm sure you could use a number of different things, but that seemed to work out pretty well for us. And it just makes sure that um, all the, the bearing and precision surfaces in there are gonna have some lubrication on them when you first try to start the engine. The other thing I did here was check the end float of the crankshaft, which is how much axial movement it has um, between the thrust bearings. It's supposed to be within four and six thousandths of an inch, and I was right around six thou, so called that good. And also hammered up the lock tabs here on the, the main bearing caps. This is sort of an old technology that they used on these engines back then that you're probably fine just with the torque setting, but they, they were there, so I hammered those up anyways too. And getting the piston rings in was fun without a ring compressor. Uh, this was one of the first ones we did and it, it took a little bit of creativity here. And eventually we found out that it was easiest to do one ring at a time um, rather than finagling around with all of them at, at the same time here. So we ended up taking them off and putting them on one at a time like this. And just doing one ring at a time and scooting the piston down and then putting the next one on.
So we got all the pistons back in here and you can see I also put in that brand new oil pump sitting right there. Uh, I bought that actually a long time ago for the first engine that I had. I probably could have gone through the original oil pump on this and cleaned it out, but I had the new one sitting around so I figured I might as well use it. And this here is the, the timing assembly for this engine. It has two timing chains uh, that run up to the camshafts driven from the crankshaft here. And this is actually the timing assembly also from that first engine that I had because it was in much better condition. This is what it looked like just straight out of that engine. It was all pretty greasy, but no corrosion on it. Unlike the, the new one that I had, which was all pretty rusted and none of those um, surfaces in there bearings on those sprockets turned well at all. But I had a couple new timing chains here that I also decided to use and pretty simple. Just clean that up a little bit and threw that right back into the engine here. So you saw me get the timing cover and then the water pump back on the front there of the engine and now the last thing to really complete the bottom end is to get the oil pan back on. So you can see we put down quite a nice bit of silicone there to try to prevent any leaks followed by the, the gaskets as well as some more silicone on the oil pan itself. And this is the oil pan from that first engine again. That's why it's so nice and clean and painted. And it definitely helps to have two engines worth of parts when you're trying to put together one engine is what I found out. But yeah, that's the completed bottom end there. Uh, again, it's not a professional rebuild by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you think it'll run. That's all for this week, but in the next video, you're going to see me tackle the, the head and finish the assembly of that and then hopefully try to get it to start up. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.